that you all see in the hospital, most of them are going to be pets, right? But even if they were a, a production animal or a meat uh, show animal, they're going to be way more friendly and personable than sheep. Sheep definitely have that herd mentality where they want to have a partner there and they're just a lot more skittish around people. Goats, um, especially the ones that are in the hospital and our pets are way more interactive and they want to be in your face as you're doing your physical exam or you try to eat everything like Travis is the best example of that. Um, so sometimes when you're doing your physical exams on goats, it's best to put a halter on them and tie them. That way you have an accurate TPR instead of like chasing them around the stall like a latte, right? Like he hates having his temperature taken, so you end up just chasing him in a circle, and that can cause an elevated heart rate, rest rate, and body temperature. So, <coughs> all of these goats, they're very used to being handled. Um, probably more so than some of the goats that are up in the hospital. So they may or may not be the best uh, representation of like a normal goat population. You can see that they're very interested in their food. Before they were fed, they were very interested in me. When I walked in here, they're just very inquisitive. Goats can kick like cattle. Um, in the bovine handling lab, I said you have to be very cautious when you walk around a cow because of how they can, they can kick you. It's very uncommon for sheep and goats to kick though. So you don't have to be as uh, worry about where your body is um, as you do when you're working with uh, bovine. Other than that, hand, I think handling goats is the easiest species to handle of all of our ruminant species. What makes it like especially easy is when they have horns. So it's not inhumane to grab those horns and hold them. And if we're in the hospital and I ask you to hold a goat or for like the students to do a physical exam or for us to put a catheter in or draw blood, that's how you should hold them is by the horns. You're going to have the most um, control over their whole body motion if you hold by their horns. They have to be very strong and have a lot of force for you to cause any damage by holding their horns. So do not worry if they're like, you're holding them too hard, you're not going to, to rip their horn in half or anything like that. And it's completely humane, it does not bother them. Although they might initially not want to be touched there um, when you go on to hold their horns. Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest differences in behavior between cattle and goats and sheep. Sheep don't have, usually don't have horns when they come into the clinic, so you kind of hold your hands under their chin and I'll show you how to do that on the goats. Putting a halter on the goats is going to be exactly the same as in sheep and exactly the same as in cattle. So I'm happy that you brought down both of these halters. This is uh, conventionally a small room in halter and you can see how thin it is and this is more of a bovine halter, how big and, and thick that one is. We'll probably end up using this one for demonstrations, but when you guys uh, do your physicals, I would pair up so one of you can just practice restraining the goat without the halter, and then the other one can do the physical and you can switch. We don't usually use the bovine halter on the goats because you can see these knots are really, really big, and they end up going in the eye of the goat, and that tends to make them freak out even more than having the halter. Just like in the cow, you're going to have the lead here, which is connected to a very movable part. Do you all see that part that's moving underneath? That's gonna go under the chin. The part in the middle is gonna go on the bridge of the nose. And then this bigger part, which is above the lead, is gonna go behind the ears. So when I go to put a halter on the horns, make it a little bit challenging. I try to make the top loop as big as I can so I can get it around the horns and behind the ear and then focus on putting it underneath the chin. Here, it does not matter if the lead is on the right or the left. If you've shown small ruminants, you know most show people want to be on the left. 
I don't care. To me, it usually depends what sort of procedure I'm doing. If I, need, if I only have a wall on the right side, then I'm going to put the lead going off to the right so I can tie them tighter that way. Does that make sense? We'll do that in a moment, but I think, because I imagine we're all going to get a little distracted when we walk in with the goats. We'll go over how to do a distance physical exam, and then I'll verbally explain a physical, and then we'll go and do that together. Does that sound good? No. Okay. So, <coughs> let's all look at this pen of our little goat friends no. here. So, from our distance exam, the things I want to look at are mentation. Are they appearing to be bright, alert, responsive? Are they quiet, alert, responsive? Because those would be my two normal mentations that I would expect. I'd be interested to see if any of them, adult or goat kid, is just sitting in the corner by themselves with their head down. That would be an indication that they potentially don't feel well and it would warrant a closer like, physical examination. No. Aside from their mentation, I want to pay attention to how well they're moving and walking around the stall. The goat kids are giving us quite a good show with all of their little pops and their gala. And, and that's, that's like really important, right? They're acting like happy, healthy, normal goat kids. Um, but I do want to see if when they're walking, are they hit? Is there any foot that they're not applying as much pressure down on the ground on? And the same for the adults. I can see she's up and standing. She looks very bright right here. But maybe when we go in there and we see them walk around, we'll be able to gauge if they're sore on any one foot, if they're wobbly when they walk at all. Um, those are important things to pay attention to at a distance first before you move on. They're pregnant, so they're going to do their best to mask any of their clinical signs. So doing as much as you can outside of the stall before you going in is going to give you the most accurate like, physical exam for that <laughs> Also, as I'm looking from a distance, I'm going to want to pay attention to their face. So she's kind of standing nice and still right there. We can look at her face. And what I'm looking for is any droopiness. Lice is very common during the winter months when animals are confined. And the good thing about lice is it's very species specific. So it's just going to make you feel kind of creepy crawly, but you are not going to get lice from the lice that you find on these goats. <coughs> I will point out that ringworms are very similar in, in these species too. 
So you know how like if you volunteer or work at an animal shelter and dogs or cats get ringworm, then everyone kind of freaks out because the human is more likely to get ringworm? That doesn't really happen in all ruminant species. It's a different ringworm organism. So the zoonotic potential is very minimal. Is that the same as cows? Same as cows, yes. The name is very challenging to pronounce. It's like, I'm gonna butcher it. Tri Trichocoftin viracosium. The one in dogs and cats is called Microsporus And that's the one that's much more zoonotic and easily transmissible. Um, so that I do that first, really, because I just want to pet them and I play with their hair, make sure to see what any ectoparasites there are, any lumps and bumps. Then I'll feel their prescapular lymph nodes and I'll go over where those are. And then I reach back to their groin and I'll feel their prefemoral lymph nodes. So those are going to be our two palpable lymph nodes pairs that we can appreciate along that, their body. Then I'll listen to their trachea. Their trachea should have louder noises than the uh, respiratory sounds I'm going to hear in their thorax. After I'm done listening to their trachea, I'll get a heart rate, I'll get a rest rate, and then I'll listen throughout the thoracic cavity for any abnormal lung sounds. Now, I don't know the history on any of these goats here. I, no one has a snotty nose that I can see. Usually when animals are kept indoors, the chance of pneumonia is a little bit higher, so I'm not sure what sort of lung sounds we might get to appreciate. It also could be challenging with how talkative all of the goats are too. Um, so just take your time listening to those lungs. It should sound normal, it's just an in and out. It's called the bronchovesicular sound. Abnormal lung sounds could be crackles or wheezes. Crackles sound like um, if you have Rice Krispie cereal and you pour milk in it and you have that crackling noise, that's what a crackle in the lung sounds like. And a wheeze would be like if I was trying to blow through a straw and I had a nice like sound associated with it. Do you guys know what the normal respiratory rate in small ruminants are? No. 20 to 30. Yeah, 20 to 30. Respirate is conserved amongst all species. So that's the <laughs> easiest one to remember. It is usually a little bit faster in all of our neonatal species, though. So I would not be surprised if their respirate went up to 60 breaths. After I'm done listening to, I already said I'd listen to all of the respiratory sounds, I forgot to ask you, what's a normal heart rate in small ruminants? This is different from cattle. You can tell me if you remember cattle or small ruminants. And they're both different from horses. So which animal? I like it better for cows. Yeah, 50 to 80 is a normal heart rate range for a cow. So they're a bit higher than a horse. And in our small ruminants, probably 80 to 120 is going to be a normal heartbeat range. And that's just because they have, they have a, they're a smaller sized animal with a faster metabolic rate. Um, and then body temperature. Do you guys know what a normal body temperature range is in small ruminants? It's a lot higher than a horse. Some clinicians go up to 104 as a normal body temperature range for small ruminants. So I usually do about 101 to 103.5. So they are not able to regulate their body temperature as effectively as like horses can or camelids. Camelids have a very tight body temperature range. They're just like horses. Um, I didn't bring any thermometers down to do body temps on them, but I'm pretty sure you all feel confident doing rectal body temperatures. Okay. Um, while I'm listening to the heart, uh, I'm going to obviously determine what my beats per minute is, but I want to listen if the animal allows me for a good 15 seconds. That way I can appreciate if there's any arrhythmia or any moment that's going to be present as well. Depending upon the age of the goat kids, if we have any ones that were recently born, you may or may not get to hear a murmur. Murmurs are not abnormal in neonates. If the murmur persists for greater than 48 to 72 hours, then it could be a cause of concern. 
But that murmur can be present just because it takes a little bit longer to adjust to extra uterine blood. After I'm done with the thorax, I usually start on either the left or the right side. So I'll do like my left side of thorax and I'll move to the left side of the abdomen. What structure is present in the left side of the abdomen? The rumen. And just like in cattle, it takes up like 70% of the abdomen. So right behind that last rib, I'm gonna push my stethoscope in and I'm gonna listen for two minutes to see if I can appreciate a rumen contraction. Their normal rumen contraction rate is a little bit faster than cattle. So for cattle, one to two rumen contractions per a two minute period is normal. For these guys, three to four rumen contractions per a two minute period is normal. And in camelins, they can have anywhere from like three to five C1 contractions in a two minute period. So they're even more hyper. In addition to counting the number of rumen contractions, we also characterize their strength as weak, moderate, or strong. And have you all appreciated a rumen contraction before? Okay, so you know it sounds like, I usually describe it as like an ocean wave that's coming through. What it actually is is the fiber component of the rumen is brushing up against the rumen wall. And depending upon how strong the rumen is churning, all that fiber material is how tough that contact is between the fiber and the wall. Normal characterization would be moderate to strong. If you have an inpatient in the hospital that's maybe anorexic, they may not have a rumen contraction or it could be quite When we go in there, I'll show you how to do percussion and succussion. Do those terms ring a bell? Have you heard those before? What does percussion mean? But that students never get this right. They always <laughs> trip up on this. Do not feel bad at all. <laughs> so percussion or succussion is going to be present when there's a fluid gas interface. So if you remember, the rumen has three layers. We have a gas cap, a fiber mat, and then a fluid layer on the bottom. If that fiber mat was not present, we'd have an interface between the gas and the fluid layer. And that interface allows for a ping to be heard when I percuss the abdomen or when I succuss the abdomen, I'll hear a splash. So in order to hear either a ping, which is percussion, or a fluid wave, which is succussion, I'd have to have a fluid gas interface. Appreciating a ping or a fluid splash is abnormal. That should not happen in a normal animal. I don't know if any of you were here long enough to know goat goat. Mm. You know goat goat. I don't, okay. So goat goat, the second time he was here, do you, do you remember how big his belly was? So for him, he would just walk around and you would hear a fluid splash. He did not have a fiber mat anymore. He had an omasal um, obstruction, we think. Um, but for him, you could just punch into his belly and hear like a, a fluid wave, or if you percussed him, then you heard a pain. And a ping sounds like if you had a kickball and you were on your elementary school gymnasium floor and you threw it down on the ground, that sound, that ping noise, that's what a ping sounds like. To elicit a ping in the side of the animal, I usually um, flick them like that. In cattle, I use my whole hands because they're a little bit meatier than the goats are, but I'll have my stethoscope on their side as I'm flicking to see if I hear that kickball sound. And the succussion is going to make you feel a little mean and aggressive, but you kind of have to make a fist and you punch in to their side and you have your stethoscope right there to appreciate a fluid wave coming back. And a fluid wave really sounds like a waterbed. Like if you've ever laid on a waterbed or like played with one, that's what the fluid wave sounds like coming back. I'll do a percussion and succussion on both sides of the abdomen. Usually you hear abnormalities on the left side, but there are some disease processes that can cause positive percussion and succussion on the right side too. Yeah. What would be the reason for the fiber mat to not be there? In our small ruminant species, probably the most common reason is rumen acidosis. So rumen acidosis is when the rumen is exposed to too much carbohydrates, like too many animal crackers. That would be a 
big risk factor for our inpatients. The bacteria that are present in the room and are gonna digest all of those animal crackers very quickly, and it causes a different proliferation of bacteria to occur. And though the new bacteria that are present make the animal feel really crummy, and they're not gonna to wanna to eat. And that fiber mat is present because of all of the food that they're consuming. So in addition to developing like a very acidic pH, in their rumen, they're not gonna to wanna to eat, that fiber mat decreases, they become very dehydrated because, excuse me, all of the room, all of the fluid in the body is getting sucked into the rumen because those bacteria are acting like really big osmos. So uh, when you go to succuss them, you hear a lot of fluid that's present on your succussion. In a cow, the most common cause of probably a decreased fiber mat on the left side is going to be a left displaced abomasum where it's usually common right after they calve, and their abomasum, which is typically on the right side, swings over to the left. It's because they have a lot of room now. The baby, that's 80 pound baby, is evacuated from their body. They probably weren't eating as well at the end of pregnancy because they were pregnant and calving, and didn't have a lot of room to fill up their rumen with that 80 pound calf in there, so that abomasum swings over to the other side. We will probably more commonly in the hospital have goats with rheumatoid acidosis. So if that does happen uh, during your shift, make sure you come over and you know succuss their uh, left side so you can appreciate that fluid wave that's present. If we hear that during our normal physical, you should. That is a, a call parameter. Yes, you should definitely contact whatever health officer is responsible for that patient. And maybe that's a known clinical finding for that inpatient, but I would still let them know. And it may or may not be true, but the house officer and or the senior clinician should check. And then if it was like a, maybe not a succussion, then we'll walk through how, like what you heard and then what we heard too. If you hear a ping, that's a call parameter too. <laughs> So anything abnormal that you appreciate on the abdomen, even if you're not sure, always ask the house officer, Emily, or the senior technician that's over there, the senior uh, clinician that's over there. So that will be one whole side of the animal, and then I do the exact same thing on the other side of the animal, listening to the heart rate, uh, ascolting any thoracic sounds, and then if it's on the right side, I'm not going to appreciate any rumen contractions in the abdomen, but I am going to listen for any intestinal sounds, and I'm also going to do that percussion and succussion. These does all just kitted. I'm unsure of their time frame for kitting, but you can see they have a pretty enlarged mammary gland. So as part of a normal physical exam, I also want to palpate that mammary gland. I want to ensure that it's the same body temperature as the rest of the animal, that it's not painful, um, and that it's uh, nice and like supple. You don't want it to be firm or hard because those would be indicators of mastitis which these does would be at a high risk to. They are constantly being nursed and then sitting down in these shavings where all of the, their poop is, whether it's from them, their goat kids, or one of the other goat families in the stall. Usually the does don't like having their udder palpated, right, like who can blame them? So I always save that for the last part of my physical exam. And then I'll move on to the head. I know that most of these goats are quite friendly, and they're very cute, so it's very, you know, you usually want to start with the head so that you can like squeeze their cheeks and everything like that, but you should always save the head for last because they are a prey animal. So when I'm looking at their head, I'm going to palpate underneath their jaw to see if I can appreciate any lymphadenopathy that's present. I'd be really looking for any submandibular lymph nodes that are there, and I can point those out to you. Um, <coughs> I'm also going to want to assess their eye color, so Fimacha, score them. Animals that have just given birth, they're at a higher risk for having a higher GI parasite burden, so you want to ensure that they have a good color. And then I usually pull down their lower eyelid to look at their hydration status. So the lower eyelid um, eyeball recession is going to be our best indicator of hydration status. They have a lot of extra skin, so doing skin tenting is not super reliable. Really, the only reliable place to skin tent is their lower eyelid if you pull that out and then see if it snaps back in place. 
You will see on a lot of these does, I see like that redhead back there, and then this one right here, there's a lot of discharge on their tail. That's probably from kidding. That's normal. Um, again, I don't know when they kid in, but it could have been from the kidding process or the passing of their placenta after. In goats, the placenta can pass up to 24 hours after, so it's very different from horses who like at three hours, you're only like freaking out that that horse is going to get laminitis and done. But in goats, it can last 24 hours. In cattle, you worry about it once they start to stop. So it can be days before they pass the placenta, and they may or may not have the problem. Camelids are a lot more like horses. You really want that placenta to pass in the first six hours. All right, how does all that 